It's Sunday morning, and we've been in study on the book of Revelation, and that's brought us to our current subject. We're talking about prophecy, and we're talking about Christmas. Christmas is paganism. Pagan means many gods. That's what Christmas is about. People will complain and say, well, you got your (coughs) belief about Christmas out of uh, two Babylons. You got your belief about Christmas out of out of the uh, McClinic and Strong. No, I got my belief about Christmas out of the Bible. That's where I got it. I found out Christmas was pagan out of the Bible. You've heard me tell the story when I was a little boy. Back 1951, I was 12 years old, and I had never seen a TV in my life. Never heard of one. Didn't even know there was such a thing at 12 years old. And then a fellow up the street got a TV. It was a huge television. It was 12 inches. My father went out and bought an 8-inch screen. It had a little rabbit ears. All they had was CBS and NBC. ABC was a fledgling network. Hadn't really taken hold yet. And all we got was two channels. And we watched everything. It was like the most amazing thing to have a movie in a house. We'd watch the old westerns, and we'd watch the Indian head test pattern. We'd watch the Midnight Mass. And as a kid, I would sit on the couch in Fort Worth, Texas, and I would look at that, and I would evaluate myself and say, here it is Christmas Eve, and the Midnight Mass is on. Is this Christ's Mass? This is supposed to be Christmas Christ's Mass. Is that Christ's Mass? Is this Roman Catholicism? As a little boy, my little analytical mind was sitting there buzzing. And then I would say, St. Nicholas, I believe that's a Roman Catholic something, priest or something like that. I found out later it was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. And I found out that everything about Christmas was pagan. When I was about 40 years old, I had studied prophecy all my life from the time I was... uh, About 1964, when I started studying prophecy, I heard prophecy from the time my father started preaching in 1949. I was 10 years old at the time. And I heard all those independent Baptists talk about a prophecy, and they would try to preach it, and they really didn't understand it. And I began to study it about 1964. I was 25 years old. And as I studied... I would study all these gods that Israel went after. I saw the Israel going after Baal. Didn't even know where to study. Baal and Grove. You say, how did you start studying the Bible? When I was about 17, 1956, I kept saying, is this all there is? My father was an old country Baptist preacher. He'd read three or four verses and tell stories for 45 minutes. And I would say, is this all there is, Lord? And then I heard a doctor of theology just spewing out Old Testament history. And I said, there's more. And I began to read and study. And I would read through the Bible. And as I would read, I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. I'd just read. And I noticed things repeating. And I noticed Israel kept going after Baal, Grove, Molech, and Shemosh. And they were going after the... uh, The tree goddesses, the grove was the tree goddess, that is the Christmas tree. Baal was the sun god. And they went after Ashtaroth. Now, everything that we're talking about has to do, all of the Old Testament has to do with Israel going after all these gods. That's why God destroyed them and scattered them over the face of the earth. God scattered them so he could regather Israel at the end of time. When the end of time comes, there's going to be a regathering of Israel, and that has already happened as of May 14th, 1948. 1948, Israel became a nation for the first time since they were scattered back here in the Old Testament. They were scattered in 586 B.C. Southern Israel was scattered. They were scattered all over the face of the earth. Northern Israel was scattered in 722 B.C. How in the world did we end up with northern Israel and southern Israel? Southern Israel is called Judah. Judah, and of course there's a tribe of Judah, but since Judah was out of Judah would come the king, and Judah was in southern Israel, and in southern Israel was Jerusalem, and in southern Israel was also the temple was in Jerusalem, 
So Judah was made up of the tribe of Judah, which was the fourth son of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, starting with Reuben and Simeon and Levi and, and Judah. And it goes on down to Gad and Asher and Naphtali and goes down to Issachar and Zebulun and so forth, all the way down to Benjamin, all to Joseph and Benjamin. And these 12 tribes were uh, the nation of Israel. And Jacob, these were Jacob's sons, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Changed to Israel there in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. Well, they went after all of these, this idolatry. As I started to say, I kept studying this. And when I hit about 40 years old, I started getting scared. I didn't read two Babylons to find this out. I did not read uh, any books to find this out. I read the Bible and I started defining these people, these gods and who they were. And I got scared one day and I said, I have got to find out. I think we are involved in Roman and Greek God worship with this thing called Christmas. So I called a professor at Washington Bible Institute. I knew that they were a predestinationist school. And I called this professor and I said, I asked to speak to the foremost history professor in the school. And I got him on the phone and I said, I believe we are, we are involved in Greek and Roman God worship with this thing called Christmas. And he didn't even comment. He just said, well, you need a set of books called Biblical Ecclesiastical and Theological Literature by John McClintock and James Strong. And you need a book called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And I got these, and all they did was verify what I had already suspected, that we were involved in Greek and Roman God worship. All idolatry started at Babel, or at Babylon. Revelation 17 and 5 says so, that Babylon was the mother, gave birth to, nourished and nurtured and brought up all idolatry. It says harlotry, all harlotry began at Babylon was the mother of harlots. And the word harlot is the word P-O-R-N-E-I-A. We get our word porn from that, pornography, when we speak of pornography. But porn does not mean to look at naked men and naked women only. It actually means idolatry. It means idolatry. And idolatry, idolatry is the Greek word in the Greek text, this is, a, this is an interlinear Bible here, and you have the Greek on the top line. Here is the Texas Receptus. The inspired Word of God is the Greek text. It is not an English Bible. You cannot translate Greek into English properly. For some of you who haven't been here, I'll just give you one example of that. If you have, you, in, the, in the Greek... I'll go ahead and put this up here. Some of you have never seen this. In the Greek, you've got any number of ways to spell a word. You take the definite article, the. You have three articles, the, a, and an. A and an are indefinite articles. If you use the word a, he is a preacher, that means there can be other preachers. If you say he is the preacher, that means in a certain context, he's the only preacher. That's a definite article. You take the definite article the in the Greek text. You have masculine and you have masculine and feminine neuter gender in the singular. Then you have plural masculine and feminine neuter gender. And then you have the cases. This is where it is in the sentence. Nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative case. And sometimes you have a vocative case. That is a direct address to show you that you can't translate Greek into English. That's what I'm going to do. Nominative is the subject, the subject, or it's the predicate nominative. Predicate nominative, for those of you that don't remember, that's, that is, like Jim, is the pastor. In the predicate, in the predicate, that is, the, that is a word, and it always has to have a being verb. That's equal to the subject. That's the predicate nominative. So... In the Greek, you've, in the nominative case, if it's a subject of the sentence, Jim is the subject, pastor is the predicate nominative. You've got just in the nominative case, 
you have six ways to spell the, depending on if it's masculine, feminine, and neuter in the singular, masculine, feminine, and neuter in the plural. In the plural. Then in the genitive case, you got six ways. Baptism of repentance. Of repentance is, is genitive. That means baptism belongs to repentance. This shows you that baptized cannot be water. Baptized, baptizo with bapto means to cover with a stain or die. Dative case is the indirect object. So you got six ways to spell the. In the dative case, Jim through John. The ball. Jim didn't throw John, he threw the ball. Ball is the direct object. John is the indirect object. Well, dative case is direct object. Is the indirect object. Accusative case is the direct object. We've already given you that. Jim threw the ball. And John is who he threw the ball to. So you got, you got six ways to spell the accusative case. To spell the. And then vocative case, you've only got singular. That's a direct address. Just speaking to someone. J Jim, throw the ball. Well, that would be vocative case. So you got all these ways. 27 ways just to spell the. You can take the word all. You have the same thing to spell all this. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he used feminine gender, and the word is hey. He used feminine gender. How could Jesus be a female way? He was talking to the church, the nucleus. He was talking to the apostles, the nucleus of the church, in John 14 and 6. The church is the wife of the bride of Christ. He just got through saying, the way you know, and he used the word tain, which is also feminine. That word ada, when it's on the end of a word, is feminine gender. He said, the feminine way, you already know, it's already written in your heart. You're the church, you're the wife, you're the bride. I am the way that's already in you. Now, how are you going to translate that? You can't, can you? That can't be done unless you... Unless you've got a Bible saying, I am the way. And then you put parentheses and you go through a long explanation and then you resume the Bible again. Well, you can't do that with a Bible, can you? No. So you can't actually translate that way. Now, where was I over here? So, you can't translate properly. And there's been some bad and translations. I use the King James Bible. But if I want to know what the word is, I go to my interlinear, I go to my concordance, I find out the meaning of these words. Now, where was I? Idolatry. Mother of harlots, idolatry. Idolatry is the word ido, lo, la, tria. Now, Babylon is the mother of all porne, which means idolatry. Idolatry is a construction of ido and latruo. Latruo means to serve, and ido means to see or perceive. The Bible, what, what idolatry is, is serving what you put into your eyes and your ears. That's why we've got to be careful what we look at and what we listen to. Because we, our body will labor to fulfill this. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1.8, The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The mouth will not simply utter it. All things are full of labor. You won't just say, I like that woman. I like that car. I like that house. I like that ring. I like that fame. I like that fortune. I like that recognition. I like that applause. If you keep putting it in your eyes and ears, your body will labor to fulfill it. That's what the Scripture says. And that makes us all idolaters. My favorite idolatry is covetousness. Is anybody guilty here of this? The word covetous, covetousness is idolatry in Ephesians 5 and 5. A covetous man is an idolater in Colossians 3 and 5. Well, covetous, if you're covetous, you're an idolater. Covetous is the word pleonectes, E-K-T-E-S. It means want more. Has anybody been an idolater here? Besides me. Huh? Everybody has. See, that's why we've got to watch out what we fill our eyes and our ears with, running down there to look at that 
that fifty, sixty thousand dollar car that you can't afford on Sunday afternoon, that's just as bad as going out there and looking at the woman you can't have or the man you can't have. Because you're saying, I want to fill up my life with that, and I can't have it because I don't, I'll work three jobs and kill myself. That's what I have to do to get it. Well, you're not supposed to be doing that. Now, if Babylon mothered it all, if Babylon mothered it all, then all you have to do is find out what, where did Babylon start? Where was the origin of Babylon? Over here in Genesis 11 4 let's read it this is where Babel started go to Genesis 11 and 4 let's read it I have I quote it but I'd rather you'd read it Genesis 11 verse 4 11 4 let's start in verse 1 the whole earth was of one language the word is sephath s-e-p-h-e-t-h It means a boundary. A, it actually just means a lip or a boundary. A lip or a boundary. Sephath. That means a lip or a boundary. That's like there was no Mexico. You couldn't go down into Mexico. You couldn't go, if you're in Europe, you couldn't go from Germany to France. There was no, it was all one boundary and one speech. The word speech is the word dabar. One commandment. All the earth was following the same commandment. Then they said, they said, and they found the plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar is down here in lower Iraq, or what we call Mesopotamia or Iraq. Mesopotamia means between the rivers. It's an old ancient word. Between the Tigris and the Euphrates, here comes the Euphrates, here comes the Tigris. They meet just before they hit the Persian Gulf. That's Iraq. That's ancient Babylon. You had the, you had the city of Babylon and you had the empire of the Babylonian system which was called Babylonia. So the city was the harlot because that is where all of this emanated from. And this is where Babel starts. And they said, come now. Go to means to come now. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And here is what they founded their system on. And let us make us a name. That's the doctrine of Babylon. That's the doctrine of self. That's the doctrine of the mother of harlots. Let us make us a shem is the word name. Let us make up an authority. This is where all idolatry began. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's throwing a young virgin into a volcano in the South Pacific in Malaysia in one of those volcanoes or whether it is uh, some, whether it's voodoo. Did you know that voodoo is sun and tree worship? It's all sun and tree worship. Japan, Shintoism is sun and tree worship. It's ancestor worship. That's all it is. That's what Christ's Mass is. It is sun and tree worship. I won't read into this, but voodoo is about ancestor worship. When you look at the flag of Japan, what's on the flag? It's the land of the rising sun, isn't it? When you look at the flag of... It's, it's either going to be sun worship or tree worship, and the tree was represented by... The crescent moon. When you look at the flag of the Turks, what do they have? They have the crescent moon. When you look at the fezes of the, of the uh, Shriners, what do they have? They have the crescent moon. Don't need to go into the moon right now. This is, so they said, let us build us a city and a tower and let us make us a name. That is, lest we be scattered abroad. They said, we want an identity. Cities, when f cities were organized, they were organized out of, out of pride. I think that's what we have today. We like the Dallas Cowboys to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. We like the uh, New England Patriots to beat the Denver Broncos. Our city is better than your city, even though these guys on the team didn't come from here. It just depends on how they were drafted in the draft, right? And how bad you played as to whether you get the first or third or, or fifth round draft choice. It has nothing. 
and cities want to compete. They always do. We're proud of our state. We're proud of our city. We're somebody. Isn't that what people say? So it all started here, and Israel became involved in that. How did Israel become involved in all of this? Everywhere you go, all of these, all of these systems, in every system of the world, all the male deities are sun deities, all the female deities are tree deities. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And that was what they worshipped, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of good and evil. And when Eve saw the tree there in the Genesis, the third chapter, she saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. And it would make her wise. John says in 1 John, 1 John 2, 16, 17, he says, all that's in the world, the, here's everything that your eye can look at, and this is all the idolatry of the world. All in the world is the lust of the flesh, good for food, it would fulfill the flesh, the lust of the eye, pleasant to the eye, and the pride of life, it would make you wise and you could be proud in your own conceits, in your own wisdom. John says this is everything. What Eve saw in the tree was for what First John 2, 16, 17 says, everything that's in the world, and that's idolatry, that's serving what you see. Serve what you see. So everything in the world can be classified under these three things. We said that demons began in Genesis 11. Demon is the word daemonion. The word demon is not in your King James Bible. The word devil is there. Devil is either translated daemonion or daemon, which is our word demon, or diabolos. The one we're talking about is Daemonion, and that word means to distribute fortunes. And when you distribute fortunes, there's no such thing as demons. You're the demon. Jesus told the man with the... He told the man in, in Mark, the first chapter, he tells the man, <laughs> he looks at the man that's got an unclean spirit, and Jesus rebukes him. The word him is A-U-T-O. It's our word auto, and automobile is self-mobile. Auto is the word self. He rebuked self, masculine, and gender, singular. He rebuked the man. The man said, we have all these demons. He says, no, you've got self in you. That's all a demon is. It's just you. And that's what we have to repent of. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Himself is a form of A-U-T-O. Let a man deny self and take up his cross daily. He didn't say let a man deny some entity that comes down inside of him. It's just self is all it is. So this is where it all began in the garden. The Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve worship was reinstituted at Babel when Nimrod started this system. And this was demon worship. And, if, and I've said this so many times. If you believe in demons, you have to believe in genies. It was all ancestor worship. The Jews said that the demons were their ancestors in the form of the gods, Hercules, Tammuz, Adonis. If you believe in demons, you have to believe in genies because what the Jews called, what the Jews called demons, the Arabs called genies. The Celts called fairies. The, the Greeks call guardian angels. All of these distribute fortunes to you and guide you to good fortune. The American Indian called them totems. They said the totems were their family and they had a totem pole. And if the totem was a wolf on the top of a pole or an eagle, you didn't kill that animal. It was your, one of your ancestors watching over you. It's all ancestor worship. And that's what Christ's Mass is. So they said that you had to... Uh, you were distributing fortunes, and that's distributing all that's in the world. And they said that the tree was all the giver of all divine gifts to men in the ancient world. Here's all the divine gifts to men, all that's in the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. The word lust is the word epithumia. 
It comes from epi means to cover with or to superimpose up your, on your life. Thumos. Thumos means to breathe hard after. Breathe hard. I've just got to have that. I've got to have that car. And I've got to have that ring. And I've I got to have it. You ever done that? Huh? Well, that's idolatry. And that's the giver of all divine. Here's the giver of all divine gifts. You have to believe in genies. Genie comes from the word gene. That's your ancestor. When you look up the word genie, it'll tell you it's a demon. They're one and the same thing. You have to believe in fairies. What do you get from a fairy? Wishes. And how many wishes do you get from a genie? All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what you get. And that is the demon of self. You can encapsulate everything in the world under this right here. Pride is the word A-L-A-Z-O-N-I-A. -A. It means self Esteem. Is that what you need? No, we need to esteem others rather than ourselves. Now, how did all of this get into Israel? Did it get into Israel? Certainly it did. If you believe in one of these, you must believe in all of them. They're all one and the same. When you study, probably the best source of this would be the, would be the Hastings over here. Look up demons and spirits. And it'll tell you, it'll go through demons and spirits among the Assyrians, demons and spirits among the Babylonians, demons and spirits among the Japanese, demons and spirits among the Christians, demons and spirits among the Hebrews, demons and spirits among the Slavs, demons. And they all have, they all have in common, and they're intermixed all through, the, all through the article. It'll tell you that it'll call demons, it'll call genies demons, it'll call fairies demons, it'll call demons guardian angel, it'll call that it calls all of them one and the same. In the ancient world, they were the same thing. You can't believe in one without believing in all of them. Now, that Christmas is pagan is without doubt. How did all of this, if Babylon mothered it all, and Babylon did because the Bible says so, Babylon mothered it all, how did this come about? Well, you got the Garden of Eden, you got all, all in the world, and then you have, after the flood, after the flood, you have Babylon beginning. The first dynasty of Babylon was in Genesis 11 and 4. You had, some people say you have 18 dynasties of Babylon. Some say you got 32, 33. Depends on which historian you're reading. You had many dis dynasties of the Babylonian system. Well, out of Babylon comes everything from Hercules... And all of this was our ancestor worship of Nimrod and his mother wife, his mother wife, queen of heaven. And who, who is not unfamiliar with the queen of heaven of Roman Catholicism? That is the Mary of Roman Catholicism. In the ancient world, the female deities were called queen of heaven. I've got to put it on the board one more time because I want to tell you something you're doing when you don't realize this. Where did this thing called Christ Mass come from? Constantine brought it in the church. In the ancient pagan world, December the 25th was the birthday of the sun gods. It was, a, and there's an exact reason for that. For those that don't know, I'll put it up here one more time. There's some of you here haven't seen this. We have the different seasons of the year, different seasons, you start, we, we're going to start with the summer solstice. Summer solstice is the longest days of the year. That's June 21st. June 21st. And all of these are three months apart. You've got September 21st, and you've got... December 21st. September 21st is the autumn equinox. And that means equal night. That means there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night at this fall equinox. 
you also have a spring equinox on the way back to the summer solstice. This is the winter solstice here, the longest nights of the year. Longest nights, that's December the 21st. Longest nights. And the pagans believed the sun was burning out. As the earth turns on its axis, it's turned on its axis, and it's going around the sun. And the earth is on its axis, turned like so. There's the axis. And when the, when the northern hemisphere, when the axis, when you get over here, you're in the summertime because the northern hemisphere is turned towards the sun, and that's why you have the warmer weather in the summer. And this would be winter. The northern hemisphere is turned away from the sun. So the earth on its axis is the same thing as this right here. And as it goes through here, this right here be equivalent to this. This over here would be equivalent to this over here. I've got it backwards, but that's okay. So, this, so the sun on its axis, as it begins to go around its ecliptic path around the sun, it gets down here to the winter. And, it, and when you get into the winter solstice, the longest nights of the year, all the pagans said the sun's burning out. When you pass the equinox, you get into what they call darkness. Because the day after the equinox, you've got a longer night than you have a day. You might have 11 hours and 45 minutes in the day and 12 hours and 15 minutes in the night. And then by the time you get down here to the winter solstice, the sun comes up around 7 o'clock and sets around 4.30. In the, winter, in the summer solstice, the sun comes up here in Middle Tennessee at 5.30 and sets around 8.45 at night. Well, we're watching the sun get darker, aren't we? We're watching at 4.30, everything gets dark. The pagans said the sun's burning out. So they had to set a birthday for the unconquerable sun, Natalis Solus Invicti. Solus Invicti. So what they did is they, is they set a birthday... December 25th, and they burnt these bale fires. We call them bonfires. They tried to heat up the earth so the sun wouldn't burn out, and they would appeal to the father of the gods. In Rome, they appealed to Saturn. You had a different father of the gods. You had Zeus and had Zeus in Greece. In Rome, they had Saturn, and they appealed to the father of the gods, said, we want your son, the sun, to come back <coughs> and give us crops in the spring at the summer solstice. We want you to do that for us, uh, so we'll sacrifice, and they had a festival that went from December the 17th through the 24th, and on the, this was a seven-day festival. As the sun would come down to the winter solstice, the longest nights of the year, and they would throw the Yule log in the fire. They had this festival. They threw the Yule log in the fire, and it would spring out in the form of the tree on December the 25th. And that's why you find the gifts under the tree, the giver of all the divine gifts to men. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Now, so they said we have to, we have to uh, make sure the sun is going to come back and give us crops. It was all about food is what it was about. They couldn't get through these long, dark winters all of this was darkness from here over to here. You notice that's all the light they had. It was mostly dark, mostly dark. And the light months belonged to Israel. That's when they had their festivals. Starting, on, starting in March, April, March, April, at, Pas at, at Passover, that was at Passover on Nisan, 14, which was March, April, that was their first festival, and that's during the crop season. That's while the crops are being harvested in March, April. And then 50 days later came Pentecost. And if you notice, this is during the light area here. During the light. Here's all the light. See? And this is the dark. And all the pagan festivals were here in the darkness. Well, Israel has their last festival in Tishri, that's September, October, the end of the harvest, and that's the Day of Atonement. And then in that month, 
That's the Feast of Ingathering. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles are the Feast of Huts. Their feast was the Feast of the Light. That's why Paul said, You were darkness, but now you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And he said that to a Gentile church, and God didn't pour out of His Spirit on the Gentiles till Acts 2. And Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles, so he says that to them. You were men of the darkness, now you're children of the light. Now, I'm going to put this on the, on the board again because this is... I want to show you what you're doing if you celebrate Christmas and Easter. What you're doing is you're giving credence to the swastika. That's what you're doing. You're actually serving the swastika because the swastika is the Big Dipper. We've already gone through this, but let me put it up here. The Big Dipper in its four phases, they just drew an imaginary line there. That is, now what you're doing, the Big Dipper, this is in the summer, fall, spring, uh, summer, fall, winter, spring. This is Yule right here. When the, when the Big Dipper gets to this point, that's Yule. This is the North Star just directly north of the earth. And the pagans would see the Big Dipper in its four phases, and they would lay it out like so, and that's the swastika, suosti, meaning it is good because it was good to get from the winter all the way back around to the spring so they could have food. And this was the scary part right there, to get over here to the winter. Now, if you are celebrating Christmas, you are giving credibility to the swastika because this was Yule down here, which they renamed Christmas, or it was actually the feast of Saturn in Rome, appealing to the gods. And this was Ostera up here. And Valentine's was right in here right at Imbo, uh, right at uh, Beltane. And Beltane comes from Baal. Beltane comes from Baal. So what you're doing, they said the Queen of Heaven, Queen of Heaven was the female deities, had to be turning that wheel, and Israel is indicted for worshiping the Queen of Heaven. Look at it in, look at it in Jeremiah, the seventh chapter. We read the, we read the 44th chapter. Queen of Heaven is the Mary of Roman Catholicism. How in the world did that get in the Roman Catholic Church? We'll tell you here in a minute. Look over here in Jeremiah. This is 600 B.C. This is 600 years before Christ. Now, I put this on the board about three or four times so far. I want you to get it in your head what it's about. This is what Christmas or Christ Mass. Pope Julius I, Pope Julius gave Christmas Christ's Mass its pagan name. Pope Julius I set December the 25th as the birthday of Christ because it coincided with the birth of the unconquerable Son. Now, it don't matter whether people like that. We're not talking about what you like. We're talking about what's true. America did not celebrate Christmas. I, was, I got a T-shirt on the back of it. It says... It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. And on the front of it, it says, Christmas is Roman Catholicism. I'm not a Roman Catholic. If you think that don't get attention, it does. The guy walked up behind me at Publix and he said, he, <laughs> he was laughing. He said, was there really a day where they outlawed Christmas? <laughs> I said, yes, the Roman Catholics killed 60 million Jews during the Inquisition, and boy, by the time I said that, he would. I mean, he lost his laughter, boom, like that. He just, he just turned his head away and walked away. And I walked up to him at the bread counter, and he walked away from me real quick. He did not want. He didn't even want to hear the rest. He didn't want to hear the rest of the story. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. The Puritans, when they were in Europe, they were families, all against. The all against family, the Huguenots, 
Huguenots, and the Waldenses. That's what they were called. That was these families and many others. They believed in predestination. These families were slaughtered by the millions. If they were, they had grown into a nation. These families had, and they were slaughtered and butchered in Europe. Sixty million Jews and Christians were killed during the Inquisition because they would not partake of the sacrament of the Mass. Christmas is Christ's Mass. The Mass is eating human flesh. It's when the, it's when these. Guys, when they raise up the round Eucharist, well, it's up here somewhere. Y'all see it? Somewhere up here. But they raise up the little round Eucharist and they say, they utter the words, Hocus Corpus Em Philly. And they huh? Oh, okay. Yeah, here it is. Here's the Mass. It's the focal point of all Catholicism. That's the Mass right there. And they utter the words, Hocus corpus in Philly, and they say it turns to the litter body of Christ, and you walk down the aisle, and you accept the Eucharist, and you can't do it unless you're Roman Catholic. You have to be baptized as a Roman Catholic. You have to be confirmed as a Roman Catholic. Otherwise, you're going to hell, and you can't partake of the Eucharist without being a Roman Catholic. You can't go to heaven without partaking of the Mass, the sacrament of the Mass. If you want to get a book that's very, very informative, this will tell you about the slaughter of the Christians. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Tell you about the slaughter of the Christians during the Inquisition, how they were called heretics, and how they were butchered because they would not partake of the sacrament of the Mass. Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's one of the most famous books out there, and anybody can get one. It is what it's about. Christmas is heathenism. St. Nicholas was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. I've got an article on Santa Claus. I read it every year. I guess I ought to read it, shouldn't I? This evidently was drawn up by a scientist. He had to do a lot of research in this. It tickles me to death to read it because it tells you what Santa Claus would have to do if he were real and how ridiculous it is. You remember when they built Babylon and they said, let us build us a city and a tower? And now nothing will be restrained from their imagination which they've imagined to do. Well, Santa Claus is St. Nicholas, Roman Catholicism. Santa Claus is what he was called in Holland. And then when he got here, it was St. Nicholas or Santa Claus. Now, this is what some scientists came up with. As a result of overwhelming lack of request, and with research help from a renowned scientific journal spy magazine i am pleased to present the annual scientific inquiry into santa claus Bring this over here now no known species of reindeer can fly but there are three hundred thousand species of living organisms yet to be classified while most of these are insects and germs this does not completely rule out flying reindeer which only santa has ever seen there are 2 billion children, persons under 18, in the world. But since Santa doesn't appear to handle the Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, and Buddhist children, that reduces the workload to 15% of the total 378 million, according to Population Reference Bureau. At an average rate of 3.5 children per household, that's 91.8 million homes. One presumes there's at least one good child in each. Santa has 31 hours of Christmas to work with. Thanks to the different time zones and the rotation of the earth, assuming he travels east to west, which seems logical, this works out to 822 visits per 822.6 visits per second. This is to say that for each Christian household with good children, Santa has one one-thousandth one one thousandth of a second to park, hop out of the sleigh, jump down the chimney, fill the stockings, distribute the remaining presents under the tree, eat whatever snacks have been left, get back up the chimney, get back into the sleigh, and move on to the next house in one one-thousandth of a second. <laughs> Assuming that each of these 91.8 million stops 
are evenly distributed around the earth, which of course we know to be false, but for purposes of our calculations we will accept. We are now talking 0.78 miles per household, a total trip of 75 and a half million miles. <laughs> you got to do that one night, 70, 75 and a half million miles. Not counting stops to do what most of us do at least once every 31 hours, plus feeding and etc. That means that Santa's sleigh is moving at 650 miles per second. <laughs> 650 miles per second, 3,000 times the speed of sound. For purposes of comparison, the fastest man-made vehicle on Earth, the Ulysses space probe, moves at a pokey 27.4 miles per second. A conventional reindeer can run tops 50 miles per hour. The payload on the sleigh adds another Interesting element. Assuming that each child gets nothing more than a medium-sized Lego set, two pounds, the sleigh is, ca <laughs> the sleigh is carrying 321,300 tons. Not counting Santa, <laughs> Santa, who is invariably described as overweight. On land, conventional reindeer can pull no more than 300 pounds. Even granting that flying reindeer could pull 10 times the normal amount, we cannot do the job with 8 or even 9. <laughs> we need 214,200 reindeer. 214,200. This increases the payload, not even counting the weight of the sleigh, to 343,430 tons. Again, for comparison, this is four times the weight of the Queen Elizabeth. 353,000 tons traveling at 650 miles per second creates enormous air resistance. This will heat the... <laughs> this is funny. This will heat the reindeer up in the same fashion as spacecraft re-entering their atmosphere. <laughs> The lead pair of reindeer will absorb 14.3 quintillion joules of energy per second. In short, they will <laughs> in short they will burst into flame <laughs> almost instantaneously. <laughs> exposing the reindeer behind them and create <laughs> create deafening sonic booms at at their wake. The entire reindeer team will be vaporized within 4.26 thousandths of a second. Oh, me. Santa, meantime, meanwhile, will be subjected to centrifugal forces of 17,500.06 times greater than gravity. A 250-pound Santa, which seems ludicrously thin, would be pinned to the back of his sleigh by 4,315,000 thousand and fifteen pounds of force now that's how ridiculous that is isn't it y'all want a copy of that you can get a copy just make a copy over on the copy machine it you say jim why do you do that well that's how ridiculous this thing is about christ's mass it's first of all saint nicholas is a roman catholic bishop some believe he was a pedophile because he kept toys for children all the time. Now, where in the world, how did this all get involved with Israel? We're talking about, so if you, if you celebrate Christmas, you're giving credibility to the swastika. The swastika is old nearly as time itself. It goes back 2,000 years before Christ. It was the study of the stars of the Big Dipper. There's seven stars in the Big Dipper, and the Lord tells uh, Amos to tell the people of Israel seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion. Don't seek the seven stars. And that's what the world did. They were wanting food. And God says I am the fertility God. I will give you crops. I'll fill up your basket in your store. What you're doing it amazes me Israel was involved in Baal in the grove. Baal was the sun god. Hercules was the sun god. In where Hercules was worshipped over there in Rome, Hercules, Tammuz was the sun god in Babylon. 
So they're all the same. They all find a common source at Babel. Babylon mothered it all, and it was all on self, or let us make us a name. Let us make up our own doctrine. Bel was the sun, the grove. The grove was the tree goddess. Grove is the word Asherah. It means upright goddess. Asherah. Let's look at the grove. Go over to Jeremiah 10. Look at Jeremiah 10. I heard some preacher read this on radio the other day, and he tried to talk his way out of it. That's not the Christmas tree. It's exactly the Christmas tree. That's, that's outrageous to say it isn't the Christmas tree. Yes, they made the tree a god, a god, and they decorated it, and they, they put a hammer and nails to it, but it's the same thing we do. Anytime you have a culture accustomed to coming to the church, it just evolves over the centuries, adding and taking away. It doesn't matter what system you go into. When you go into all these systems of the world, they all started at Babel. They're all the same thing. It doesn't matter what God it is, and you're going to find no matter where you study these, it's all sun and tree worship, regardless of where you find it. Whether it's voodoo from Haiti or from Africa or whether it's whether it's the South Sea Islands or whether it's, whether it's Roman Catholicism, now the Baptists are Roman Catholic. And the Pentecostals are Roman Catholic. The whole world is Roman Catholic. Aren't they? They've got their gods. And Roman Catholicism was founded on tolerance. When Constantine issued the Edict of Toleration, he said, we're going to allow the pagans to come into the church in 325 A.D., when he started Roman Catholicism, he said, we're going to amalgamate Christianity and paganism. He was about to lose the empire to all, the, all of these hordes rampaging across the European continent, the Huns and the Vandals and the Visigoths and the, and the Celts and the Gauls and, the, and all the rest of these hordes and tribes, the Saxons, the Vikings. They were rampaging. He said, I will amalgamate their sun and tree gods I'll bring it into the church. I'll mix it with the Feast of Saturn, the Feast of Saturn in Rome. And he says, we'll put the Feast of Saturn, which is a seven-day festival, and we'll mix the tree goddess with so-called Christianity, and we'll come up with Christ Mass. So whenever Israel is involved in all of these gods, since all of it started at Babel, it has a common source. It's all sun and tree worship. This guy read this on the radio, and then he started making excuses. You can't make an excuse. This is the tree worship. Look here. Jeremiah 10 and 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Notice he's saying the same thing as he said in Leviticus 18 and 31. He says, the customs of the heathen are vain. He says, I am the Lord, therefore shall you keep my ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. He's not even telling Israel don't serve their gods. He's saying don't do their rituals. Don't even serve me with their rituals. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way, the customs, the rituals of the heathen. And do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and gold. Now what's the color of the garlands? Silver and gold. They put literal silver and literal gold back then, but we're not going to do that on the trees in America. But it's still the same stuff custom they fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not put it on a stand because it can't move it has to be born it moves not that it move not they are upright as the palm tree but speak not they must needs be born because they cannot go these tree goddesses can't go on their own 
Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like thee, but they are altogether brutish and foolish. The people who cut this tree out of the forest, they are ba'ar, that's the word brutish. They are dull of hearing. And remember the hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord hath made even both of them. They are stupid. Stupid means you have the understanding of a brute beast and you can't be taught anything. Kenneth Copeland is stupid. Man who will not hear the truth of the Word of God, they are stupid. It means you can't learn. Ignorant means unlearned. Stupid means, well, like the old saying goes, stupid is forever. You can learn if you're ignorant. But if you're stupid, you can't learn. That's from now on. And then he says, the stock is a doctrine of vanities. The word stock is the word E-T-S. It's the same word as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the same word as tree, the stock of a tree that they cut down and they make, bring it out of the forest. It is a doctrine of hebel, vanities. That's the word hebel. And that word hebel means worthless. Christmas is a worthless doctrine. We don't do that here. I will never do that. I literally hate Christmas because Jesus hates it. You think if he destroyed Israel for 2,600 years over this system that he wants us doing it? America's going to go down. It has to go down. And then he goes on down here in verse 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder in these foundries confounded by the graven image for his molten image is a falsehood and there's no breath in these gods. That tree was supposed to spring out in the form of Venus the next morning. They threw the Yule log in the fire and it sprung out in the form of Venus. The Christmas tree is Venus. The Christmas tree is Diana of the Ephesians. The Christmas tree is all the female deities. The Ashtaroth. The Christmas tree is Aphrodite, Mileta. That's who it is. The females were the tree goddesses. The male de deities were the, were the fire. Were the sun gods. Now, look over here. Now, Israel, Jeremiah is prophesying to Israel. Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years. Israel was a nation from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. And God says, I will not put up with you going after these idol gods. And he tells Moses, before they were under kings, before they were a nation under kings, they were under judges for 300 years. Before that, they were 40 years in the wilderness. Before that, they were 400 years in Egypt. Before that, there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. Before that. So all the time they were a nation, they kept going after these Christmas gods. And God says, I'll scatter you all over the earth. And he scattered them for 2,600 years. When you see the things that's going on in Israel today, it's because Israel went after the same system that we call Christ's Mass 4,000 years ago. Now look over here. Now here's what Israel did. Look over here in Isaiah, the, 40, the, Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Isaiah 40. Every time you find grove, that's the upright goddess. When Israel went after the grove, that's the upright goddess. Now look here in Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melteth the graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. There's the gold and silver again, isn't it? There's the garlands again. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation, no bread offering to offer to God, a person that's poor, chooseth a tree that will not 
rot. And what is that? That's an evergreen, isn't it? Among the Scandinavian countries in northern, north of Europe, they said that the evergreens were magical trees because they could live through sub-zero weather and still be green. So they took this greenery and they hung the greenery around their pagan temples among the Vikings, among the Saxons that were up there in that time. And they would hang it around their temples and take the greenery of the tree and take the holly and they commemorated their, their tree goddesses this way and they had what they call a wassailing bowl. The wassailing bowl was a big bowl they gathered around and when they gathered around it, they would drink and they would put this holly in their hair, have candles on their head. They would gather around this wassailing bowl and they would drink and get drunk and they would sing that old wassailing bowl, bowl song. Deck the halls with boughs of holly, fa la 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 What does that have to do with Jesus? That is a drunken old wassailing bowl pagan song out of, out of the Scandinavian world. It's nothing to do with Jesus. You think Jesus wants us to do that? No. They chose a tree that would not rot. What is a yule log? The what? Yule log. means wheel. That's what it means. It means wheel. I got a... See if I got something here. I was going to read to you something on yule if I got it. Hold on a second here. I think I've got something on yule. Let me read to you. I've got a thing of Yule and Yule here. Yule means wheel, and the, wheel, the fire wheel was the swastika. Here's all different forms of swastikas. You have the dextral gyrate that breaks to the right, the sinistral gyrate that breaks to the left. This is the sun wheel. This, this was also called Thor's hammer. Thor was supposed to be the son of, the, of Woden, in Woden, St. Nicholas' pastor is, is, uh, is uh, patterned after Woden. We get, our wi- word, we get our name Woden's Day or Wednesday after Woden. Moon Day is Monday. Tuis Day is Mars Day. Uh, Thor's Day is Thursday. Freya Day is Friday, which is the fish god. And Saturday is Saturn Day. And Sunday is the Day of the Sun. And all of these were pagan in their original origins. But those are not customs. We're not using a custom. These were various variables of this. And Woden was said to have flown across the sky on a great white horse. And he had the, the little Charlie Chapman mustache that Hitler had. And Woden, there's a picture of Woden that Hitler liked so well. He kept a picture of it. And he patterned his mustache after Woden. And Hitler was a fire worshiper. And he went to Tibet. He took, had sent Henry, Himmler, his chicken farmer, who's head of his SS, to Tibet. He was a chicken farmer. And he sent him to Tibet to measure the Tibetan Buddhist worshipers. And they were called Svastis. And they had the Svastika. And he brought it back from Tibet. He was looking for a superior race. And he measured the, these people in Tibet, these Tibetan sun worshipers, because they were tall and had long fingers and long arms. And he was looking for himself a superior race, an Aryan race. And he wasn't Aryan. I don't know why he was looking for one. But this is, uh, this is uh, pictures of the swastika. And this comes out of a book called The Twisted Cross. And it's about the swastika. Hitler was a sun worshiper. And most people don't know that. that that's been around a lot, long, long time. Let me see if I got this. I think I've got something on Yule in here. I've got it. I don't know if it's in these papers right here. Let me thumb through this. If I got it, I'll read it to you. Well, yeah, here it is. That's where we get, I guess, Yuletide. Yeah, Yuletide, yeah. Yule was a pagan word. It was one of the points on the swastika. It was that lower point down here. It's that point. It's that point down here, right there. That was Yule. They used the word Yule. That, that meant wheel, and they used that to denote the whole wheel. It means wheel or, or it, some say it meant child. Let me read this. Yule. This is out of McClinic and Strong. The old name for Christmas is still in provincial 
popular in England. It points to heathen times. It points to heathen times. It points to heathen times. Let me say it again. Points to heathen times and to the annual festival held by northern nations at the winter solstice. This is out of McClinic and Strong. Look up Yule. It's the best set of books you can find in the world right there. You get you a set of McClinic and Strong, you can learn a lot. At the winter solstice, as part of their system of sun worship, in the Edda, the sun is styled Fragrahol, fair or shining wheel. And a remnant of this worship under the image of a fire wheel survived in Europe as late as 1823. It was a fire wheel. The inhabitants of the village of Cannes on the Moschelle were in the habit on St. John's Eve, another Roman Catholic holy day, of taking a great wheel wrapped in straw to the top of a neighboring eminence, making it roll down to the hill, flaming all the way. So they went to the top of the hill, set it on fire, and rolled it down the hill. If it reached the Moselle before being extinct, a good vintage, a good crop would be anticipated. Food was always about. Fertility gods, that's what they were. And God says, I'm the fertility god. If it reached the Moselle. A similar usage existed at Trier. The Greenlanders of the present day have a feast at winter solstice to rejoice at the return of the sun. You see, it don't matter where you go, you're going to end up with the same basic beginning, the same general foundation. And Wormius tells us that in his time, the Icelanders dated the beginning of their year from Yule. The Old Norse, Hoel, Anglo-Saxon, Yuval, have developed into Iceland, Heol, Sweden, and Danish, Hejul, English, Wheel. That's the wheel of the year, the swastika, or the Big Dipper. And the whole idea was food. But from the same root would seem to have sprung Old Norse, Joel, J-O-L, Sweden and, and Danish, Jewel, J-U-L, Old Saxon, Geo, G-E-O-L, English, Y-U-L-E, applied the same uh, applied as the name of the winter solstice, notice winter solstice, longest nights of the year, either in reference to the conception of the sun himself as a wheel. When you see the when you see the sunburst or halo, or you see a form of the swastika is the Maltese cross, the Germans gave that to their aces in World War I, and that was the Maltese cross, that was a form of the swastika. Wherever you see a cross, that's like this. This is a form of the swastika. That's a Roman Catholic cross, isn't it? When you see that, that's a form of the swastika. When they put these, put these little knobs on the end, that's just a different form of it. That's a, just a form of it. Or you see it like this, and you'll see the head of a saint in the middle of it, and they'll be sitting here, and that'll be behind their heads. That is, that is called a nimbus, and that is just the swastika with the sun involved in it. The priest wore tall white pointed hats, white robes or white sheets, and they worshipped a flaming cross. In the ancient world, the priests of Baal did that. The clan comes out of the same system. They pulled their dress and everything out of that sun worship of Baal worship. And the priest of Baal, Kahan Baal is the word priest, Kahan Baal, and we get the word cannibal from that, and the priests of Baal ate human flesh from their altars, and they were cannibals. And what is that when you eat the literal body of Christ? Cannibalism, isn't it, Gary? Gary was a Roman Catholic. It's cannibalism. So were you, weren't you? 
Gerald was a Roman Catholic. He knows all about that. That's eating human flesh. Let me read the rest of this. The general nature of the observance of this festival are noticed under the head of Christmas in the greenery which we still deck our homes and places of worship and in the Christmas tree laden with gifts we may see a relic of the symbols which the pagan ancestors of the modern English signified their faith in the power of the returning sun to clothe the earth again with green and hang new fruit on the trees. But you know why people won't read this? Takes too much trouble. Takes too much trouble to go find a McClinic and Strong. Besides that, who wants to read this when we just let's just do Christmas easy. Of the returning sun to clothe the earth again, and the and the firmity until later eaten in many parts of England on Christmas Eve or morning seems to be lingering memory of the offerings paid to Hulda or Berta the Divine Mother, the Ceres of the North, a personification of fruitfulness to whom they looked for new stores of grain. It was all about fertility worship. The burning of the Yule log, Yule clog, or Christmas block testifies to the use of the fire worship of the sun. This is out of an encyclopedia. But they don't print this kind of information anymore. You got to get a McClinic and Strong. Those were printed in the 1800s. You can't get that kind of information out of these current encyclopedias. They quit printing it. They don't burn books anymore. They just quit printing the truth. In 1684, Herrick tells in his Hesperides how the Yule log of the new Christmas was wont to be lighted with last year's brand, and already in some year its blazes are condemned by warm stray as foolish and vain, not countenanced by the church. The religious keeping of Yule and Easter <coughs> has been one of the articles of Perth which had been strongly objected to. On the accession of William and Mary, the Scottish discharged what was called Yule vacancy of the court sessions compelled the judges to attend court at the period. But in 1712, an act was passed reenacting the Christmas recess. The act was given offense to many Presbyterians in Scotland because they did not believe in Christmas. How much time do I have? Let me read something to you. Christmas is Christ's Mass. I had wondered for years if I had wondered about the Christmas Carol. Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. I had wondered if Ebenezer Scrooge was patterned after a Puritan. I researched it. That was exactly what he was patterned after. Charles Dickens was a heathen. Charles Dickens was racist. He thought all Jews needed to be exterminated. All American Indians needed to be exterminated. And his gripe was against Ebenezer Erskine. Ebenezer Erskine was a pastor, a Scottish minister. Scotland was the home of John Knox, the great Puritan and John Knox was a predestinationist and believed that Christmas was paganism. And so did Ebenezer Erskine. I had wondered that. I had thought that something was wrong with Dickens all along because when Charles Dickens in the 1800s wrote that book, The Christmas Carol, with Tiny Tim and Bob Cratchit and all the rest of the characters of it, I kept thinking... Back then, in America, it was against the law to celebrate Christmas. Or it was commonly understood that Christmas was paganism, even though they repealed the law. And that the Protestants in America had nothing to do with it. And that where he was raised in Scotland, and when he was preaching there, one of his big nemesis was Ebenezer Erskine, and he patterned Ebenezer Scrooge after that because Ebenezer Erskine preached against Christmas. I kind of figured that's what it was. And Ebenezer Erskine was a Scottish minister whose action led to the establishment of the Secession Church. He was a minister of the Church of Scotland. Uh, he was part of the Associate Presbyterian Church united with the most Reformed Presbyterian Church and they believed in these doctrines of predestination and they believed Christmas was paganism. 
Let me read to you something here. Probably the most famous Baptist preacher of the 1800s was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I've got, I've got 25 or 30 of his books. He had predestination on every page of every book he ever wrote. The Baptists say he's their mentor. They don't believe that. Let me read you what Spurgeon said about Christmas. These are Spurgeon's words. Baptist, it says. Baptist minister. He died in the late 1800s. We have no superstitious regard for times and seasons. Certainly we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. That's Charles Spurgeon's words. One of the most famous preachers that's ever lived. Most people have heard of Charles Spurgeon, haven't you? We find no scriptural word whatsoever for observing any day as the birthday of the Savior, and consequently its observance is superstition because it's not of divine authority. Probably the fact is that the holy days were arranged to fit in with the heathen festivals. How absurd to think that we do it in the spirit of the world with a Jack Frost clown, a deceptive worldly Santa Claus, and a mixed program of sacred truth with fun, deception, and faction. Baptist minister Charles Spurgeon. That's what Spurgeon said about it. He said it was corrupt. Now let me read something to you by about Mr. about Ebenezer Scrooge. The name Ebenezer Scrooge was inspired by the gravestone bearing the name Ebenezer Lennox Scroggy. In life, Scroggy was apparently a rambunctious, generous, and licentious man who gave wild parties, impregnated the odd-serving ranch, and once wonderfully interrupted the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland by gambling or grabbing the buttocks of something, hapless confessors. However, in 1841, when his entire life was misconstrued by Dickens, Dickens was in the capital to deliver a lecture to an audience of Edinburgh notables. He was wandering the city, killing time before the talk, when he visited the Canongate Kirk graveyard. There, as revealed by the diaries, he saw a memorial slab which read, Ebenezer... Lennox Scroggy, meat man. The description referred to this man's trade as a corn merchant. However, the author mistakenly translated it mean man, though he was shocked by the description. It gave him food for thought, yet two years later, art imitated, and so the author believed. When Christmas Carol, one of the Dickens' finest character, finest works, was published in 1843, it feeds it, featured Ebenezer Scrooge. Then he goes into Ebenezer. The choice, however, of this name from among many that could have been used in the composite character that made up his fictional Ebenezer Scrooge was not lost on the audience of his day. They knew who he was talking about. Ebenezer was a famous antagonist against the urban the observance of Christmas in Scotland, the same location the name Ebenezer was chosen from. Scrooge repeats many of the complaints against the observance of Christ's Mass that Ebenezer Erskine had advocated and Dickens himself, an upper-class Englishman who advocated Christ's Mass against Ebenezer Erskine's position, was well known in the controversy. He was slamming the Puritan writers of his day he hated those people. Charles Dickens was a rascal. Instead of making progress in the work of reformation, we come to a short time to fall under the weight of some new and heavy grievances. And he goes on further in this. He goes into a section here. How he says all the American Indians needed to be annihilated. So did the Jews. So did many other races. He was a very hard and calloused man. So when he wrote A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge was a slam against what I believe. Because me and Ebenezer Erskine would have gotten along like two peas in a pod because he believed Christmas was pagan and he believed in predestination, election, the sovereignty of God. 
That's amazing, isn't it? And he goes into this one section here how that he was a racist, how he didn't he didn't like anything but white Anglo Saxon people. And you had to be fancy at that. Now, how in the world did all this come in? Let me just give you a couple of things. How much time do I have, Mike? I'm going to stay on this subject all the way through the end. Like I keep saying, this is not one message. This is not many different messages. This is one message. When you go back to the beginning of these messages, we're going to go all the way through everything that, everything that this is about in the Bible. Now, we know that Israel... Let me just give you a real quick rundown. We'll give you a quick rundown. God picks out a man named Abraham arbitrarily in Genesis, the 17th chapter. He gives Abraham the land of Israel. He says, it's your land. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people in generations as they come along. And, and you will keep my commandments. If you don't keep my commandments, I'll bring judgments. He gives, that, he gives that land to Abraham in Genesis 17, gives it to Isaac in Genesis 17, and then in Genesis 28, he gives it to Jacob. Jacob, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel in Genesis 32, and then Jacob has all these 12 sons, and they become the nation, and his 11th son, Joseph, is sold into bondage, is sold into bondage, in Egypt by his brothers in Genesis, the 37th chapter, 37, and then ends up in Egypt. He ends up in Egypt, and he rises up to the top of Egypt, and he becomes second to Pharaoh in Egypt. And then Israel stays in Egypt for 400 years. Then they're delivered by Moses at the end of the 400 years. They're 40 years in the wilderness. They come back to the land that's given to Abraham, 650 years before, before Moses. They come back to the land. They go into the land. They are under judges. And God tells them, he tells Moses, if you go after these other gods, when he gives him the law on Mount Sinai, uh, before, right as they're going into the 40 years in the wilderness, he gives him the law. He says, I'll send four judgments. If you go after other gods, I'll send sword, famine, pestilence. And then I'll send the beast. The beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. It's the Babylonian lion there in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. It's the Persian bear. Persia overthrows Babylon. It's the Grecian leopard. The leopard overthrows, overthrows Persia. And the Roman beast with iron teeth, iron teeth beast, overthrows all these other three and rules in the New Testament. So Israel goes after other gods all the time in their nation, 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. They go after Baal, Grove. It's the same thing as Christmas, same situation. Grove, Ashtaroth. It goes through all these gods that Israel goes after, and we're going to cover the gods that they go after. God says, if you do this, I will send sword, famine, pestilence. The last thing I'll send is the beast. Assyria comes in, carries northern Israel away. Assyrian is a Babylonian system that carried northern Israel away in 722 B.C. Southern Judah is carried away in 586 B.C. Or southern Israel. Then they are, of course, they're split into two nations because Solomon allows his 700 wives and his 300 porcupines. <laughs> 300, 300 porcupines. 300 com combines <laughs> I'll get it right in a minute 300 combines they're out there plowing all day long 300 uh, concubines he allowed them to have their gods and goddesses in first first kings the 11th chapter so God says I'll split the kingdom because Solomon did this don't ask me why Solomon did that I don't know as wise as he was so God splits him to two nations he has northern Israel carried away because the in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, Jezebel and Ahab, Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, she comes from, her father is the prince of Tyre. Here's Israel here. Here's, 
here's what we call Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon, and her father is the prince of Tyre, and they worship Baal and the grove there. And Baal is the same thing as Hercules, the writer of, of McClinic and Strong says, Baal is nothing but the Tyrian Hercules. Which birthday was December the 25th? So northern Israel brings this sin through Jezebel and Ahab in 1 Kings the 16th chapter. They had been worshiping Baal in the grove, but they had never made Baal in the grove a national god and goddess with temples built to them in northern Israel. All the Levites say, we're not going to put up with this, and they run south to southern Judah. Northern Israel is carried away in 1 Kings, the 17th, 18th chapters. That's where they're carried away. Southern Judah's carried away, excuse me, in 2 Kings 17, 18. 2 Kings, the 25th chapter, Southern Judah's carried away in 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter. 36th chapter, southern Judah, or southern Israel. So all of Israel is carried off into captivity. They stay into captivity 2,600 years. Everything in the Bible is about Israel going after these idol gods, these tree and sun gods, which is the same system brought into the church by Constantine and renamed Christ's mass. Every, every, every god of the Old Testament is the Christmas system. Every God. There's no such thing as a God in the Old Testament. That's not the same thing as the tree and the fire worship. Do you get it? And God destroys Israel for it, and He wants us to do it. You are kidding, you preachers out there. But you know why they don't preach against it? They don't know what the Old Testament is about. I've spent 58 years in the Old Testament. They have no idea what they're doing. Billy Graham doesn't have the foggiest idea of what's going on in the Old Testament. Charles Stanley is, an, is a moron. Nails his foot to the floor, talks in a circle and sounds talks in a circle and sounds like the worst marriage counsel I ever heard in my life. I don't like those preachers. Won't you like them? They talk about Jesus. No, they talk about another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel that Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. And he says that's Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. So they stay scattered until 1896 when a man named Theodore, Theodore T-H-E-O-D-U-R-H-U-R-Z-L, he sees a Jew being slaughtered and killed on the streets of Paris. So he starts something called Zionism. He says, we've got to have our own land. He does not foresee Israel becoming a nation at all. He certainly doesn't see them uh, in 1917 being liberated from 400 years of slaughter and butchery by the Ottoman Turks. Theodore Herzl, H-U-R-Z-L. And he doesn't see that. And the Arabs have been living in that land for 700 years. And then in 1920, the Balfour Declaration is issued. And the Balfour Declaration, Mr. Balfour was the foreign secretary for Great Britain. And when 1917, when a General Allenby of the British forces, when he enters in and liberates Israel for the first time, in 2,600 years from slaughter and butchery. And that Balfour Declaration makes Israel a satellite province of the British Commonwealth. That expires May 14, 1948. And Israel is declared a nation by the National Council at Tel Aviv. And the United States puts pressure, Harry Truman put pressure on everybody in the world to cause Israel to become a nation. Harry Truman's a hero to those people. And they became a nation for the first time since they were carried away captive. And the reason they were carried away captive was because they had gone after Baal Grove, the same system that's been brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass. I know what I'm talking about, you preachers out there. You don't. Does that make you mad? It infuriates me. You mean God's going to destroy Israel? Look at, look at Luke 21. 
I'm going to be bringing this out nearly every message. Now we can see Israel kept going after these gods. Luke 21, verse 20. This is one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible concerning the end of time. 20. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. When is that? Jerusalem is compassed with armies from 586 B.C. all the way to the Six-Day War, June 5th through June 10th, 1967. Where the, where the Jordanians were thrown out and Israel gained control of Jerusalem for the first time since 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter. Since 2 Kings, the 25th chapter. The first time they've had control. That's the whole chapters. You want to look at all the whole chapters, 25th chapter of 2 Kings, the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles. Look, for the, look at the last 12 to 15 verses of that chapter. I'm going to go through those next week. I'm going to go through Israel being carried away. We're going to go through every time that they went after Baal in the grove and went after Ashtaroth, went after Molech, went after Shemosh. Shemosh was the sun god of Moab and Shemesh is the word sun in the Hebrew. Moab is southern Jordan. That's the land of southern Jordan. Shemesh is the word sun in the Hebrew. It's just a variation of the sun god. All of it's sun and tree worship. I, you know, I've never heard a preacher in my life preach about sun and tree worship of the Old Testament. Never. And that's what, that's every idolatry of the Old Testament. Every idolatry. That's the reason every prophet prophesied to Israel. Every one of them. Don't matter if it's, if it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Daniel, or Ezekiel, or Hosea, or Joel, or Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and Nahum. Whether it's Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Every one of them. Every one of them prophesied concerning the sun and tree worship that Israel was involved in. Not, their message is the same, isn't it? How many times have I talked, gone and read about Joel or Hosea? And they're talking about Israel going after Baal. Israel offended in Baal. And Hosea, the 13th chapter, the first verse. Isaiah, the 28th chapter, the first two verses. Just constantly they went after Baal in the grove. I've had people come here and say, why was God mad at Israel? They went after Christmas. I really do know what I'm talking about. If you're watching, I know what I'm doing. You know, Charles Sandy, you ain't got the slightest idea what you're doing. I'm confident to call him down if I call, saw him in person. Say, mister, if you don't stop your lies, God's going to send you to hell one day. Do I believe God would send Charles Stanley to hell? Oh, you bet your life I believe he will. Do I believe Baptist preachers are going to hell? I believe hell's going to be full of Baptist preachers. And I was raised a Baptist, and I was ordained a Southern Baptist. That's why I give them a hard time, because there was one time... 150 years ago, they believed in the doctrines of predestination and they believed that Christmas and Easter were pagan. That's why I go after them. They have apostatized more than anybody I know. Pulled totally away from the truth. Pulled away from Charles Spurgeon. Don't call Charles Spurgeon your mentor. He's not. He's my mentor. But he's not yours. I love to talk to Spurgeon when I get to heaven. I want to talk to Thomas Watson. I love to talk to John Bunyan. I'm going to come back and we're going to go through all this. He says there in verse 24, They, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword and they'll be led away captive in all nations and Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and then there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing in for fear for looking after the things coming on the earth the powers of heaven shall be shaken we're headed towards that I don't believe this world has got much time this thing in the Middle East is going to explode I preached on Gog and Magog recently Gog is nothing but Gog and Magog is nothing but the area of Armenia. Meshech is over here in the middle of Turkey. Tubal is over here. Uh, Togarma is right here in Syria. 
And all these nations are going to gather together to attack Israel at the end of time. It looks like they're amassing this right now, doesn't it? If I repeat some things, it's because I believe you need to have it repeated to you. This We're talking about... Nobody knows this information, do they? Nobody knows. Nobody even cares. I am so fed up with America that doesn't care about the truth. I've already made more enemies than I can shake a stick at, so it, I, one more or less ain't going to matter. I'm going to tell everybody I can the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us. Help us to understand this thing we're in so we can continue. Give us strength. Lord, I pray for the church that you'll strengthen the flock. This is a hard message for people to have to deal with, especially in a world where that our eyes and our ears are filled with all of this. You said we'll serve what we put in our eyes and ears. Lord, cause us not to do that. Lord, cause us to pull away from the world. Lord, I believe your coming must be soon. I don't know how soon, Lord. It might be after I'm dead. But, Lord, I pray for the sheep here, that some people here, that they're young enough that they may see your coming. Lord, I pray for the elect out there. You pray you'll lead us to them. Open up the doors. And we'll praise you for all things and glorify you. In Christ's name we pray, man. Well, that ain't all, folks. Come back next week and we'll keep on going in this. We'll keep doing it. Huh? Oh, okay. I just, that was really astounded me to find out that Ebenezer Scrooge was patterned after a Puritan. I believed that when I, I had believed that years ago, that he was patterned after a Puritan. What, what would you think Bah Humbug would mean? Well, just, that's just an old saying that means I don't want anything to do with that. It's just, it's, people don't like this, but it's the truth. It is absolutely the truth. I mean, I've spent a lifetime. I've spent 58 years studying this. I'm 73 now. I'm not a beginner at this. And it's... But boy, you want to make people angry. Tell them Christmas is paganism. 150 years ago, your great-grandparents did not do it. They absolutely did not. America's only been celebrating Christmas for about 120 years. That's it. I'm talking about the Protestants in America. It's Roman Catholicism. They slaughtered the, they slaughtered the Christians and Jews by the millions during that Spanish Inquisition, which finally went all over the world. And it's everywhere. You can look at the Barbarian series on TV, and you can even look at the Gladiator when when he's fighting the Germanic tribes on the northern border of the Roman Empire, and Maximus is out there fighting them. He was a real man. He was in history fighting them on the northern border. 